Okay. Thank you all for like braving the cold tonight and the lack of parking. Um, so we'll just get started. And today, um, I just want to mention that this panel is part of a larger program of activities, um, all under the heading of Merging Mindsets, which is a series of events and activities that is intended to build community and create opportunities for artists and art organizations and interactive digital media companies to explore the digital tech in art and the art in digital tech. Um, some of the intentions of, with this is to build bridges between communities and improve digital literacy in Manitoba and to demonstrate that this is an area of growth and potential within multiple sectors. Um, we would also like you to know that there we have a conference coming up on uh, that is part of this series on March 13th and 14th, and it takes place at the Manitoba Museum. Um, and that will include panels with expert, ex, oh, ex, <laughs> experts like the ones you're hearing tonight, um, roundtables where the attendees can help map out the future of digital art in our province, um, interactive art protection VR examples to try out, um, a tour of the inner workings of the planetarium um, food, of course, and if you want to uh, check that out, you would go to mergingmindsets.com. Um, and so Merging Mindsets uh, is a project of Creative Manitoba, New Media Manitoba, and Video Pool Media Arts Centre, which is where you are right now. Um, and that we would like to acknowledge the support of the Canada Council for the Arts Digital Strategy Fund for uh, funding this project. Um, and then before we start, uh, I will introduce you three, but I would also I want to acknowledge that we are on Treaty 1 territory, the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, Denny, and the home land of the Métis Nation. Um, in acknowledging the land that we are on, landing who the land we, <laughs> acknowledging whose land we are on, I invite you to take the time to read and act on the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's 94 Calls to Action. It's a really um, important document that is easy to read. It's not all legal jargon, so it's very important. Um, and I just realized that June will mark the fifth, five years since it's been written or released. And as we know, time is passing quickly. Um, <clears throat> and I would also like to note uh, that this is, it is our intent that these events foster a supportive, non-threatening environment for everyone to participate and share in. So regardless of gender, ability, ethnicity, or cultural differences, we ask that you please be welcoming and respectful of worldviews that differ from your own. Um, so each panelist will talk for 15 minutes to, you know, keep it in that time. Um, and then I will ask some questions along with any questions that come up from the audience. And so I will briefly uh, read the bios to you of each one, um, I'm reading them in order of who is speaking first. So first, it's Hel Helga Jacobson, is an artist living on Treaty 1 territory. In 2017, she received an MFA from AKV St. Joost, Joost, the Netherlands, in conjunction with courses in transdisciplinary new media program at the Paris College of Art in France. She has participated in residencies across Canada and Europe she has given lectures in France, the United Kingdom, Colombia, and Canada, and was most recently selected for the Emerging Excellence Award by the Manitoba Arts Council in 2019 and by V2. Center for the Unstable Media. Okay. Uh, for the graduation edition, in recognition of being one of the most, uh, one of the five most promising graduates of 2017 across Europe working in new media. She's currently working and researching with the Swarm Collective on bee ecocultures in the age of, I got, I'm gonna get this, I'm gonna get this. <laughs> Cthulucine? Cthulucine. Cthulucine. Or, oh, the, the first part is silent. I looked that up. As well as exploring, amplifying, and reflecting on the barely visible, tangible, and audible. Um, and next to Helga is Curtis Wax. He, he is the Director of Research and Development at the LUMO Interactive, having previously held the position of Chief Technical Officer. For nearly a decade, Curtis has been collaborating to create interactive art and experimental exhibits for brands. Prior to joining LUMO, 
He spent a decade honing his game development skills with a focus on educational and interactive markets. Um, and next to Curtis is Margaret Noble, um, who has come from the warmth of San Diego and is now here, and walked from the hotel. Um, Margaret Noble was born in Texas and, raised, and was raised in California. Her experimental artworks have been exhibited nationally and internationally. Her interdisciplinary work resides at the intersections of sound, sculpture, sculpture and performance. She holds a BA in philosophy from the University of California, San Diego, and MFA in sound art from the School of Art Institute of Chicago. Noble's work is influenced by the beat-driven dance culture of Southern California, which flourished during the 1980s and later led her to perform as an electric music DJ in the underground club community of Chicago. In 2004, she branched out from the dance floor into experimental sound art for new audiences, which intersected the electronic sound scene and the visual arts community. During this transition, Margaret created sound works for collaborative projects in video, dance, and object theater. Her artistic works have, been, have now evolved into sculpture and installation influenced by interests in memory, history, narrative, and identity. <laughs> That's all right. Um, okay, so Helga, if you would like to begin. Yeah. Um, well, I'd like to say thank you for having me. Um, I I'm, I'm, was really interested and excited about talking about interactivity. Um, I'm going to do so kind of by giving you a little overview to my work. Um, and I'm going to try not to run long because I tend to do that. Um, <clears throat> so my interest in interactivity kind of comes from a desire to understand where things intersect, where they meet, um, where they brush up against each other, um, looking at how they connect and dissolve and, and kind of morph and shift. Um, I like looking at uh, systems and the ripples and impacts that actions and energies have on um, each other, on the, an environment, um, and... Yeah, the devices and installations that I'll be talking about um, deal directly with understanding um, the quality of conditions of interaction. Um, so I'd like to start by talking about um, a work of mine that kind of started my interest or maybe was the best digital um, output of my interest in interactivity, um, which is called Arachne's Sonifier. Um, it's a machine that plays spider webs as music. Um, so it, it works um, as a photo transistor array, um, as you can maybe see um, in, in the bottom image more than the top. Um, all of those little holes are photo transistors that read light. And so when um, there's a light uh, on the motor that projects the spider web onto the back plate of the, of the device and then um, rotates it around, and as it goes, um, the stab lamenta, um, like the strands of the spider web, trip the sensors and then play MIDI notes. And so then you're able to kind of hear a reflection of, of the web, um, not literally playing the web, but kind of a poetic um, way of seeing it. Um, so that work stems from kind of research into mythology and thinking about voice and how to express voice. And so spider webs work as as instruments for spiders. They play them um, by plucking their strands and in a way that spiders can only hear. And I, I was thinking about that in relation to the myth of Arachne, which is um, Arachne was a, a mortal woman who was very, very gifted at weaving. And she challenged Athena to a weave off and won. Um, she, while Athena chose to um, depict all of the times that the gods beat out the mortals, um, uh, Arachne spent her time weaving all of the times that Zeus raped women. And in spite and anger, Athena then turned Arachne into a spider. And, um, and I just think there's kind of a poetry in, in thinking about these webs as being the products of a voice. And so I wanted to find a way of kind of um, honoring that. Um, and so what I did was to to further, so that, that felt kind of like almost a prototype of the idea, but I wanted it to be something that you could interact with more. So I started collaborating with a local dancer named Hilary Christ, um, and we went to a residency in France together uh, where we collaborated with um, 
la maison des insectes in um, in this uh, insect kind of museum um, uh, just outside of Paris, which was really lovely. And we created this work, so I'll kind of show you a little bit. sits on kind of like an overhead projector that projects it uh, onto the wall where there's an array of the phototransistors. So it took that what was happening in that small box and amplified it into space. Um, and then I invited Hillary to create a choreography that also kind of reflected this because I wanted to he like hear the connection between um, a human body and, and the spider web. So just to kind of complicate it a bit further. So I'll just kind of skip ahead. Um, this video is on my, my website. Um, but what you'll start to hear is the sound changing as Hillary's shadow trips over the sensors as well as the spider web. So it becomes this kind of sound that is not belonging to either one of them, but rather kind of um, an interaction between the two. illustrates how, how that, that machine works. And so I just uh, kind of kept going with it, and I wanted to continue to hear the impact that bodies and beings have in a space. And so I created a work um, called Sympoietic Sound, um, which, which I'll show you. It's, um, it's a, an installation that brings in plants that are being um, played out into a space as well as the spider webs playing on their own and then there was a performance with Hillary and another dancer. Um, and so when you're in the space itself you were able to hear um, hear all of these kinds of sounds that, that would shift depending on um, how many people were in the room, um, who was in the room, if people were touching the plants, if um, the dancers were dancing, um, if people were choosing to play with, um, play with the sensors and I just I really liked the idea of, of being amplified, being able to amplify the reverberance that exists ambiently in a space, um, yeah, with, that you don't normally think about, I guess. Um, I while I was working on that work and developing um, the the kind of machine slash instrument that that I played or let the plants play out with, um, I also found out that a local conservatory was being closed down. Um, so the Assiniboine Park Conservancy, Conservancy closed their conservatory um, uh, two years ago now. And, um, and they did so because the plants had started to uh, ruin the foundation of the building, um, causing it to crack apart. And they weren't able to regulate the heat in the space. And they weren't able to... Um, to keep it going, the, there were trees that were pushing the, the glass out of the top of the building. Um, and so they had to demolish it. And so I went in and um, recorded all of the plants um, individually that I could. Um, and I'm, I'm still working on the final composition of it, but I, I did so by creating um, just bioelectric uh, capacitance sensors that then I outputted uh, to MIDI notes and then I, I kind of took an overview of the conservatory and I mapped it out as though it were an orchestra pit and gave each um, plant like this uh, this staghorn fern was my tuba for instance because it happened to exist in the space and also somehow to me I, I felt it was a tuba so then I, I let it play that in the MIDI um, catalog from Logic. Um, yeah, uh, I, yeah, 
I think that's where I'm going to leave that one. Um, I I also used this same kind of um, technology to uh, present work at a recent show in Ottawa. Um, it was part. It was a collaborative um, process that um, that outputted as. Um, works from two other artists and myself working conceptually together so we we kept in correspondence throughout the development of the show um each of us working with plant matter in very different ways um hence the name terra matter uh, and we so jillian the painter that you can see up in the background and now whitney lewis smith so jillian king and whitney lewis smith um both use very different modes than i do but we're all working towards um, kind of being able to understand human impact on, on the natural world and also looking at entropy and also looking at, um, yeah, climate change and things, um, yeah, things that revolve around plants and don't center uh, the human as much. And so in this one, I worked with them to um, understand the different things that were impacting their process, and I wanted to create a reflection of that. So we, we worked together to design a soundscape. So each of these plants in the space um, were connected um, to a device that would play an audio file that um, either I took sound recordings when I was in Ottawa, or if I also found this um, really great archive of um, audio files from from nature in from the 60s um, and so I took some sounds from there and I took um, yeah in some of the Im in some of the images like in uh, Whitney's photographs there are like snakes and uh, when Jillian was working on her paintings there were a lot of cicadas around and so I kind of brought all of those together and let it play out in the space and this one was really interesting because every time that I work with this kind of process um, I'm able to understand it a little bit better and when we were having the opening, um, there were just so many bodies in the space that it shut down and, and short-circuited the system because I built it so that it would last in the space for a long period of time. And, and I was given kind of numbers on how many people would be in. And so I was making sure that um, there wouldn't be as much interference. But the opening was just so full that, that it slowly shut down. And, and they were very... Um, they're very particular about like how you can work in this space. So I wasn't allowed on ladders, but they kind of turned a blind eye so I could hide the equipment, but they didn't want me to be up there for too, too long. And um, and so when when that happened, I thought to myself, oh my God, I, the whole thing's wrecked. I'm gonna have to recode everything and they're not gonna let me up there. And sure enough, as soon as people kind of started leaving the space, then the music just came right back up. It was, it was quite fantastic and terrifying. <laughs> Um, but it really does reflect the kind of space in the atmosphere that that um, is existing in the room. Um, or maybe there was just somebody with really bad vibes in there and they didn't like him. You know, I don't know. Um, so that kind of brings me to what was in my bio, which is that I'm, I'm currently working with a collective called Swarm. Um, and and while, while I started working with them, I was also a mentor here uh, through the Data Mentorship Program. Um, and and um, and yeah, I really wanted to create work that was reflecting all of the research that I was doing. Because a lot of my practice um, comes in line with theory and comes in line with um, with yeah a lot of discussions and discourse. And so um, so I wanted to make a work for the showcase for my data mentorship um, program. Um, that reflected be eco cultures and queer ecologies, and which call us to um, yeah reimagine and um, different ways of being and acting in line with um, with the natural world, which does things better um, than a lot of our man made solutions to things. And so I was thinking about defense, and I was thinking about um, the way that we handle handle defense, and trying to think with um, demilitarizing. Um, and I came across this phenomenon that bees do when they're in a swarm. And so when they're migrating a queen from, from area to area, the whole, um, the whole hive gets together, bi uh, binds themselves around the queen, and then migrates. And so when they're in this, this is called a feral swarm. And so this is what they do when they're trying to defend their queen. 
So when something comes towards it, they ripple out in this way that um, that's quite visually stunning and a showcase of solidarity. Um, and and I really like that idea of 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 coming together and being part of a community and using um, using that as a way of reimagining um, defense. And so I made this machine that um, uh, yeah emulates this shimmering. Kelsey took this video. Let me say it again. Thank you. Yeah, so this is, um, yeah, just a simple um, kind of reflection of the way and an ode to the way that, that bees do it better. And that's where I'll leave it. Thanks. Hi. I'm sorry. I'm, uh, I'm far less prepared, so I'm just going to be opening things as I go. So I come from a different background. Uh, I'm more technically minded and less artistically minded. Uh, but me and a friend of mine, Megan Atavle, got together about 10 years ago and decided that we wanted to kind of make neat things like this uh, interactive Wonderland party. So uh, my ba ah, apologies. My background is again more technical, so Megan would uh, bring me these challenges and say, I want this to react to this and do these neat things. This was a text controlled wall where people could text uh, messages to the wall and it would write things on the wall or if they sent specific keywords it would trigger hidden animations within the wall itself. And the whole thing was themed after the, uh, the Alice in Wonderland book. All of the art was actually lifted from the book which uh, was then animated. In addition to this we also had our first uh, interactive floor. Uh, it was a system that used a camera pointed at a mirror which was angled at a floor and uh, it responded to people's movements and would cause a series of uh, creatures to run away from people as they moved over top of it. And as I say it now, it sounds extremely simple as this is the majority of what I've done with my life in the last 10 years. So the, the systems I have now are much more robust. But people, people really, really loved it. So from that, we decided that we wanted to try and do this for a living. It was kind of like a, a hybrid of art and business. From there, we would experiment with things uh, with varied success. This was on top of a warehouse over on Ross Street, which no longer exists, uh, using a giant projector that and an animation that I put together in five minutes. But people thought it was the greatest thing ever. <laughs> Uh, so we attempted to try and do more and more work around the city, uh, around interactivity or, or video mapping, video projection. But we rapidly found out that Winnipeg is not a city with money. And it was very, very, very difficult to, to make a living doing this. And th that may have changed. This was ten, nine, ten years ago when we were trying to make a career out of this and people were a little more leery about spending money about uh, things that were very hard to, to, to explain. It's like, we're gonna make cubes go across your building. What does that mean? <laughs> there wasn't uh, as much stuff on the internet to show people. And it, we ended up doing way too much work for exposure. And as anybody that lives in Winnipeg knows, you can die of exposure. <laughs> <laughs> in more ways than one. <laughs> So after a couple of uh, jobs like that, we started moving towards making a, uh, a platform. Uh, we found that the interactive floors were the most scalable technology that we could create. So uh, we started making a reusable set of packages because we found that uh, most people wanted these interactive floors where 
kids would step on them, the crabs would squish. And uh, we started building out a, a software platform around that that would allow us to, to, to sell what things we made. And rather than having a bunch of little one-off things with the same uh, code base behind it, we actually <coughs> sold a launcher platform and then you could put it side load games into it that would uh, react to the movement. It's okay. Oh, and apparently that video doesn't work. Oh, it's, it's four seconds long, that's why. Okay. <laughs> I grabbed the wrong video, I'm sorry. This is actually our, uh, an, our first iteration of the software, if I can get it to pause, there we go. And it is terrible. Uh, one thing we learned early on is that people think differently. <laughs> so what, something that made a lot of sense to me as a programmer and coder made absolutely no sense to anybody else. And th this is nonsense even to me now. I, I, so there was a lot of uh, iterative development as I like to call it, but it, it, it uh, we, we found that over the uh, years that all, most of our processes are iterative. Any, any art we do, any uh, games we make, anything we do is iterative. We, we start with a very blocked out process and test it against people or test it ourselves, make sure that it's interesting, it's fun. And uh, over the years, we ended up with a much more robust and better, robust package with much better games. And even now, this is actually very dated. Uh, this is actually, some, that was uh, something we did for the Children's Museum here in, uh, about five years ago. I don't know who I'm looking to for confirmation of that. <laughs> uh, one of the other things we found too is that it was really nice to make tools to allow people to make games on our platform. Uh, so we started developing a series of templates and things for anybody to upload their own graphics, tweak the behaviors of the games. And I got a, a lot of enjoyment out of watching thing, people make things with the platform that we provided. So we've kind of gone more all in on generating these tools to make things easier for people, be it somebody that just knows how to upload things and tweak sliders or somebody that wants to actually code. And it works perfectly with all of our motion controlled systems. We've even had people commission us to develop uh, art based installations based on our code base. Uh, I forget where this is installed, I'm sorry. I believe this is installed in somewhere in Estonia. But we use uh, the skeletal tracking capabilities of the Kinect sensor to uh, create these uh, effects and also influence the backgrounds behind people. I've even started uh, recruiting my son to help me. The only downside is that this has, holds no magic for him anymore. This is just normal. It's like, hey, let's go play the wall games downstairs. <laughs> so yeah. Uh, I'm afraid a lot of what, what I do is more commercial in nature and less artistic, but there, I, I like to think that there's some art, art being done with it. Uh, I'm afraid that's all I have. <laughs> um, so, as you know, I'm Margaret Noble. I'm really happy to be here. I came a long way from San Diego, and I'm very appreciative of the opportunity. 
I am working in interactive art pretty heavily. And I think in order for me to tell my story about interactive art, I really needed to speak about my influences. And I grew up in San Diego in a neighborhood called City Heights in the 1980s. And the 1980s were a really fun time for a kid. Um, portable sound was everywhere in my neighborhood. So people are walking around with Walkmans and cars are tricked out with elaborate sound systems and people are carrying beat boxes and ice cream men are chiming melodies through the neighborhood. And also there's the magic of electronic sounds. Uh, there were arcade games at the liquor stores where you'd get a quarter and go play and it was really rewarding and exciting to see the colors and the sounds come together. And of course there were plenty of sort of cheap electronic toys. And it seemed that at that time everything was really moving and things that you could participate with. So dance was big, roller skating was big, there were new uh, things that you can use on video games to move your hands, and everything was spinning, all the sound equipment, turntables, cassettes. So for me, my response was to look into dance, and hip hop was very big in my neighborhood at the time, and of course, you're coming off of disco from the 70s, and the best way I was able to connect with dance was to become a DJ. Um, to have a little bit more control over the experience. And so later on, after I grew up a little bit, um, I became a house music DJ. And for me, this was this perfect synthesis of all the influences I had had as a young person, all the things that really interested me. Um, connection, movement, technology, electronic sounds. And I think this is really what speaks to interactivity for me, because you're having a relationship on the dance floor with a bunch of strangers that you don't even know, and you think that you might be in control uh, by playing certain tracks to get them to move, and then you discover they're actually the ones in control, and when they don't dance, you change the track, and when they do dance, you keep using that same track, and so that connection, that relationship, I think is where I really started in interactive art. But eventually I grew out of that. Uh, you can only do so much with two turntables, and I wanted to do more. And so I moved forward uh, to try different things. I got my uh, MFA in sound art at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. And right after that, I ended up just doing sound design for other people's visuals. So I supported dance troupes and puppet troupes and video artists. And, and that was uh, collaborative and meaningful. Um, but I wasn't totally using my voice. And then in, in 2012, I got a breakthrough solo exhibition at the MCASD in San Diego. And I got a chance to actually make an installation that used my artistic voice and my artistic narrative. And that really gave me license to explore new mediums. And I think that's why I'm here today. From there is where I began doing interactive sculpture and installations beyond the dance floor. So no longer um, in the nightclub, no longer a dance floor. Now I'm in art, uh, art galleries and uh, different types of venues, setting up objects where people can participate and touch and experience the work. And the audience becomes the performer in my work. And I really like that outcome. This is the first piece I made of this series of interactive sculptures. Um, I wasn't sure if I it would stick, but I wanted to explore it, and it was called I Long to be Free from Longing, and essentially it was nine sounds embedded um, in a suitcase. And what I realized is it was ideal for sound art, because sound art is really difficult to exhibit. Um, it's difficult to share space with folks. It's difficult to be heard. And also, uh, sound art often is, well, it's time-based, so you don't know when the beginning is and when the end is, and I wanted the audiences to start the work at the beginning when they were ready. And by making it interactive, they didn't hear a sound till they touched something. This is another piece um, I made. It's called Post-Life Repository, and it's a look at our digital graveyards online or whatever we've left behind of old bios and relics and social media and websites. But I transcribed it to the life of a cricket 
and I record a cricket for one week until it passed away, and I spread out its various sounds and manipulations of its sounds in this bl black box, and the audience can hear each sound when they're ready by pushing the buttons. What I've also learned about interactivity is that I think this type of work really, it really creates audience investment. So rather than someone just walking up and looking from a distance, you're actually asking a lot of the audience to touch your work, to listen to the work, to figure out what's going on. And I think that kind of commitment uh, gets your work really seen and you connect more with audiences. This is a piece I made called Material Shrine for the New Class and it's a look at transhumanism. And in order to experience that, um, audiences had to wear cordless headphones and touch each object to hear a specific sound associated with the object. This is called a ship pile of lights and sounds for your pleasure. And this is also another look at the black box and the consumption of lights and colors and sounds. And it doesn't work unless someone uses the planchette with the crystal ball looking very much like a Ouija board. And they don't really get much out of it, but when they slide around, sounds and lights pop off and it seems to work. I also like that interactivity creates dialogue. Um, I think a lot of conversations happen when people participate so deeply with the work. And in this work uh, in particular, I aim to exploit that I set up two music boxes, it's called a score for conversation, and I invite uh, audience members to try to communicate through the music boxes rather than using their voices. In this piece, uh, which is called We Don't Have to Make Eye Contact, I also invited two strangers to approach either side of a music box and consider uh, what they feel their responsibility is when they meet a stranger on the street. And it's actually quite awkward in the gallery, and I think that really brings a lot of discussions, too, from the interactive aspect of it. This is a recent piece I just did. It's called Dogma Roulette, and it examines uh, dogma in science, and it only works with five players, and you uh, are able to bet on a dogmatic worldview and spin the wheel of problems, and depending on what problem emerges, maybe you're stuck in traffic or you don't have health care, um, if you would like to win a dogma roulette, you need to debate to the very end and persuade everybody else that you were right. And so naturally there's a dialogue in the work, but also there's a performance in the work that brings a dialogue from the people in the gallery experiencing it. I also think that interactivity is can create intimate moments um, because it is a person alone with the work, sometimes in a very quiet gallery. Uh, this is my piece called Head in the Sound, which is about social anxiety. And in order to engage with it, you actually have to put your head in the hole, which triggers a light sensor, which triggers a sound. This piece is called Index of Fear, and it has a collection of cards um, that have words and pictures and little sound recorders, all the types of fears that I've collected and uh, heard from others. And I felt like this was also really intimate when people would go through it and sort of test to see, well, what were they afraid of? Did they align with the fears presented in the box? I also think that interactive art has a violence to it, especially with motion sensors when you're walking into a museum and suddenly it's assaulting you. Um, and, and I think that can be exploited in really interesting ways. Uh, this piece is called What Lies Beneath, and when you approach it, the light turns on, and the audience members are invited to lift the lid, and when they do, screeching vo violins sort of yell at the participant, and people quickly put that lid right back on. Um, this one is a feminist piece. It's called Now is Not a Good Time, and from the distance, it looks like an antique sewing basket, very feminine, but there are rattlesnake tails embedded within it, triggered by motors, and when the audience approaches it, the motion sensor, they start to rattle at you, and it can be a little intimidating. And then this piece is called Clamor Machine, and it's a series of vintage car horns embedded in archery bows, and it's really loud when you approach it uh, and approach the sensors. Um, and I was looking at the noisy rhetoric of our media and politicians. Um, 
like you uh, said as well, I think that interactivity is iterative. The work changes with every venue. You might have one vision and think, wow, this is how it's going to be. And then you install it, and people don't react the way you want them to, or the materials don't react the way you want them to. And so you have to be prepared to let that performance evolve. So in this case, I had a work called Drift, where folks um, were blindfolded and had a surround sound cordless headphone set on, and they went through a ropes course. And in the next iteration, it became a multi-user experience, and people were actually inside of a labyrinth-like series of corridors. There are some problems in interactive art um, that I've found, and one is that when you're touching things and playing things, it makes it like a toy sometimes. And sometimes that's a dominant experience with the interactive work. And you might want that, but you might not. In this case, I chose to exploit it. I made a work called All Eyes Are On You, and audience members were free to just treat it like the toy it was, make a lot of sound, and push it throughout the gallery, and it's a really noisy, giant wheel chime. But in the case of this work, it really backfired on me. And so this project is called Scaled Discords. And it was a look at white privilege and racial inequity in America. The white tops are silent, and they're on pedestals. And the black tops make noise. And the red tops are a homage to Black Lives Matter. And even with the great amounts of context I tried to add to it, for the certain participants, it was just a toy and it never really read the message that I intended. So I thought that was something I really need to think about moving forward. Um, other challenges are, um, unless you make your work very hardy, folks might break it if they're allowed to touch it. And so how do you make it so it's touchable um, and feels special, but it can last multiple um, audience members examining it? And then, of course, interactive art's always interesting because people are so blown away they can actually touch things. Um, and what I'm learning is that facilitation is the key for audience experience. So maybe you have instructions up, but ultimately a docent or the artist really helping people to understand how the most meaningful experience to me makes the best outcomes. I also think that interactive art creates community. And this is a really large scale public art project I did called Time Strata. Uh, we locate ourselves at the end of a pier and we put several microphones underwater and above land to catch the sounds of the environment. We also brought in several experimental instruments. We piped all those sounds to a master mix, and then we made several small mixes for audience members to come and explore and make their own mixes and compare mixes and talk about what they think they're hearing. And we managed to get the neighborhood to come out as well as the art community. And I think that act of just engaging with the sound uh, really brought more dialogue. And I'm not gonna show a closing video because I'm fairly certain I'm at my 15 minutes, but if you're curious about actually hearing or seeing any of the works, I'd invite you to come to my website because there's a lot of video documentation. It would make it more clear. Um, thank you very much. I, we'll see how it goes. Maybe you can th throw it on at the end. <laughs> um, so I have a couple questions, and then um, probably there's a couple people that have questions. Um, my first question is for all of you, because you all have experience with this. Um, what is the most important thing that you need to know about humans in order to get them to interact with your artwork? I know I need to make people feel safe. Um, and I know that when I don't make people feel welcome and safe in the exhibits that I have, that they're not going to engage. And so I don't know if that speaks to knowing everything about humans, but I, I think that to get anybody to participate, you can't alienate them. You have to help them feel like it's worth taking a risk on a really strange and foreign experience. Um, for me, in my practice, I'm I'm not I'm I'm not so much interested in getting people to engage with it, but maybe collaborating with people is really important for me because I think that consent um, is very important, and um, and I I want people to feel like they can, can 
choose not to participate. Like it doesn't have to be relational, but you gain more if you do come in. So I really like um, trying to, yeah, I echo that, keeping it very welcoming and keeping it very, um, yeah, encouraging for people to, to engage if they choose to. I found a lot of the time uh, people are shy to engage with a lot of these experiences because they're usually very public. So uh, they're in inhibited. So if you make it something very familiar, like a, uh, in my field of work, if it's a soccer game or a hockey game, people are like, I know what that is. I want to play it. Or if you make it something collaborative or multiple people, so somebody's already doing it and then somebody else can join them and then somebody after that. It, it, I find that encourages people to engage with it more than <clears throat> if it's just one person use, uh, using it because then it feels more like a performance piece and they're the performer. And a lot of people don't like to feel that way. Um, uh, so I'm also wondering if, um, um, if it is possible for this type of artwork that you work within, if it's possible to make something interactive which is requiring some sort of input um, and autonomous, which is functioning without an input at the same time and have the same quality. Does that make sense? Kind of. Kind of? Yeah. I think <clears throat> the way that I'm understanding it is like, uh, can it stand alone even without being interacted with? Yeah. 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 That's super key for me. Like I think with the shimmer piece, um, I... I made it from materials that were meaningful, so they were all, um, it was all recycled material um, that uh, was visually interesting enough that if people didn't want to come, they could glance into the room and, and still, I think it would still be really lovely and kind of this showcase, but it's just maybe all the better if you come towards it and, and play with it. Uh, that is something that I actually discovered uh, in our early days is we used to make games that were more of a surprise. So you'd have these projections on the floor which were all black until somebody walked on them. And we found that people didn't even notice them because there was nothing to entice them to, to interact with it. They just, they, it was either something that looked like a piece, of, uh, like a, t a television or a p something projected on the floor that they were supposed to not engage with. We found people would actually walk around it unless there was some sort of call to say, hey, come play with this. It's something to be played with. You need to to do that. So now any any of the interactions we make nowadays have some component that indicates that people should come and do something with it. So through your design, you have mm -hmm. to think about that invitation, whether it be... F Sometimes it's as simple as a start button. Like a lot of our stuff is games, so just having a button that says press this and people will come up and step on it or push it on the wall or whatever. And then that starts it and it makes them realize that this is interactive. Right, the invitation. Mm. Yes. <laughs> um, sometimes, well, I do, uh, I create some, I do create interactive artworks and sometimes when I am doing it, I often wonder and I'm fearful of it being a one trick pony. Do you have any experience with that? or how to avoid it, or how to know? I mean, I really thought that that first suitcase, which I, when I, sh I cringe at that work now when I show it, but it was I needed to kind of get into the medium somehow. And I thought, oh, is this a one-trick pony? Great, activate sounds. But I think anytime you do something experimental, you wonder, and if it's an anomaly, right? Uh, people might think it's a one-trick pony, but the more you make of it, the more you put it out there in the world, it suddenly becomes a genre. And I think to avoid having something be a one-trick pony is to keep working in that medium and finding out how far you can explore it, right? For me. I have kind of a similar feeling, but in, but in maybe a different output where um, I, I, I focus more on concept then, where I'm... I would like for the work to have enough meaning or purpose behind it that if you're not really interested in in the the uh, interaction that's being offered to you, then at least there's there's um, an area where you can uh, put your mind into. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. 
a lot of the times it also comes down to what you, you want your engagement time to be. If you want to have like a high volume of people move through something, you don't want to have like a half hour experience because then it takes forever to, especially if it's a single user experience. So, so it, it sometimes depends on what, what your goal is. If you want to have something meaningful and thoughtful for a long period of time or something that people look at that, go, ah, that's really neat and move on. <laughs> So uh, that's another th design thinking that you, when you develop your work, is that the intention? You have a very clear intention about how long you want them to stay with it. Um, and then I'll, I'll stop and, and let other people in a moment. But uh, uh, I am just curious if you could just like say one or two like pieces of software or hardware that that is your, just your favorite thing that saved your life when it came to developing your work? What would it be? Just so people know what kind of work. That would probably be the Connect, because that kind of changed a lot of rules for uh, vision development and uh, how accessible it is now. It was a little uh, hacky at the beginning, but it, it's just changed a lot of what uh, I'm able to do with uh, interactive projection. Can you just like, just for people that don't know exactly what the Connect is, can you just... And Sorry, the Connect is a, a camera owned by Microsoft originally uh, released for their uh, Xbox, and it has a skeletal tracking uh, library in it, so it allows me to recognize users' uh, points on their uh, skeleton and react to it. In, or uh, we have a, a game that everybody loves where it puts mascots' heads on everybody's in the video feed. <laughs> So are they still producing the Connect, or do we have to dig them up from like? They've actually moved away from the consumer market, and they have now released a like thousand dollar version of the Connect. Right, because it used uh, to be cheap. <laughs> yeah, it used to be a couple hundred bucks, and now they've been like, nope, nobody wants that for gaming. Everybody wants it for custom art installations or uh, to put in the supermarket to track how many people walked by this aisle. So like, we can charge more money for that. Let's do that. <laughs> right. <laughs> I was just gonna say if you're not tech savvy, there's plenty of ready-mades out there and you can achieve a lot of goals, even motion sensors, light sensors, different types of sound devices. And then the, the challenge is up to you to make it feel original and unique, but you don't necessarily have to have a, a serious technical background and, and you can find very affordable electronics if, if that's your type of interactive work. Not all interactive work has to be electronic. I think on, I'll piggyback on that because <clears throat> for my practice, I'm not so much interested in in um, high tech. I'm really interested in accessible, and so a lot of a lot of the codes that I work with, I open source, and I um, I also like to work with things just like Arduino and keeping it really simple, which is um, yeah a, a very small board that you can make do very great things. <laughs> uh, and then I think I think also like um, the what's allowed me to expand my the sound elements of my work is working through pure data in um, in Raspberry Pi uh, or using a Raspberry Pi and with the program of uh, pure data which is a coding program um, and that's not as easy to access but but it's been really nice for me <laughs> thank you um, is there anything that anyone wants to ask from the audience I can go first. I mean, I, I always find out the hard way once I get to the venue, and I just try to make the work as best I can before. And But I think what I have had to learn uh, through exhibitions is I need to start managing the expectations of the venues I work with because it's a big ask to maintain the works, to provide uh, good uh, docent speakers, um, and so that's uh, something I as I move forward, I've had to make tech manuals and... Uh, really insist on a training of working with the space to make sure that the work um, goes over well because they, initially they're very captivated by this idea of interactive work. So great, all of our students will be really interested in it. But I don't know if they're always ready for the challenges that come with presenting s these technical projects. Um, I think for my practice, uh, it's very much site specific and very responsive to the space. Like I'm 
like with the work that I talked about in the Ottawa um, City Hall Art Gallery was um, I had to code specifically to the space and to how many people would be around because it is this way of trying to amplify what the space will be producing. Um, um, yeah. Uh, it, it varies a lot for me because a lot of the times I'll be given specs from a client saying we want it to do this in this space and then we'll, a, a space that I'm not even like halfway around the world that I will never ever see and then they'll come back and say it broke for these reasons. Actually usually it's just it broke. That, that, that was helpful. <laughs> Once, but then we'll dial it down to like okay you need to control how many people are walking in because 12, pe 12 skeletons in the scene is now overloading the system and it can only, uh, there's only a, enough uh, processing to handle four or something like that. So uh, it gets a little iterative at, at, at that stage. I think my harshest critic for any of the things that I create though is still my four-year-old. It's like, I spent three weeks making this. This sucks, daddy. <laughs> <laughs>
it it's kind of it's kind of a tricky thing because I I reuse the boards that I that I work with over and over again. You've seen that that the the pieces that I make kind of have similar technologies, and I'm able to to manage that pretty well. Um, and there are pieces that um, the code is, I suppose, the artwork that needs to be kept, and so that's pretty manageable on a file system. But for instance, the work with the Entropic Symphony, um, that's an immense amount of data, and so then it um, that I'm is one of those that I'm like always scared about. I'm like, what if? my hard drive gets stolen or broken or something like that. And that's a really dear one to me. So um, I just live in fear every day of my life. But no, I just just kidding. <laughs> um, but I yeah, it's it's a it's a hard one. Um, and that's also part of why I'm 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 happy that my practice has led me in a way where it's less object oriented and more um, yeah, purely around the interaction that happens where um, but on another level, I have a jungle that I live in. So the plants that I use are also these living beings that are my companions. So that's another level, but again, not really around the tech side of things. I wish I had plants in my archive. That would be so lovely because what I have is stacks and stacks of boxes in my garage and I try to pack them carefully and leave myself meticulous notes so I can bring them back and have spare electronics for them. And I will cross my fingers that they will live on, but ultimately I feel like it comes around as performance, right? How does the performance live on? And that's usually through the documentation and video documentation really tells the story. Um, the other thing that's further to that in terms of artwork and being interactive and difficult to archive is that they never get collected. True. So museums are not, and art galleries are not interested in having these things that they can't run. And in fact, that it's actually very difficult to even get them to agree to, to uh, exhibit them because there's so, you have to be there or you have to, so that's an extra cost. So. Well, on that, also, you have to pass different electrical inspections. I don't know if you've had issues really with that. It is a terrifying. <laughs> you know? in a union shop. Yeah. <laughs> Always fun. Anything else? OK. Well, thank you so much. That was really enjoyable. I really appreciate hearing your point of view. Thank you.